one of the most comforting matters, at least in my opinion, in the Christian faith is God's sovereignty over all matters and the fact that God is outside of time. God has come to time, yes, when he took flesh. When Christ came into the world, when Christ was born, when the second person of the Trinity took flesh and was born of a virgin Jewish poor girl called Mary, about 2,000 years ago, that's when he came into time. But God it's himself exists outside of time. So we can clearly say and easily and confidently say that God is in the past, God is in the present, and God is in the future. Because he exists outside of time, he exists outside of space. Therefore, we can also affirm that God was in control of the past, God shapes the present, and God is taking care of the future. He's doing all these three matters at the same time. What a, what a wonderful God we serve. When we look at this passage, we, we can see that God was taking care, at the same time, God was taking care of Abraham, God was providing for Abraham, and God was ensuring that Abraham would be faithful. And at the same time, God was taking care of Isaac's future, taking care of his wife. Abraham was not looking for a wife. God was already taking care of Isaac's wife. I mean, a wife for his son, of course. So on today's sermon, this will be made abundantly clear that God is the one who is perfectly in control. But we also see plenty of human responsibility on today's text. So any, without any further, let us, let us begin. But let me also recap, let me remind us all. Uh, let us all be remembered of what we have seen so far. So far we saw clearly on this chapter that Isaac is displayed here as a type of Christ. He was carrying the wood that he would be killed with up the hill, just like Christ had to endure. And willingly, he did not went under pro he did not go under protest. He did not climb up the hill against his will, but in obedience to his father, perfectly trusting the words of his father, just like Christ, went up the hill of Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, which in the, the Latinized version we called Calvary, uh, went up the hill of Calvary, carrying his own wood, carrying his own cross, in order to trustingly in his, trusting in his own father, to do the Father's will on the top of that hill. We also see that the lamb, the lamb itself, is also a type of Christ. God said, okay, like God did not say, okay, you know what, I saw that you did not deny me your son, so about this whole sacrifice thing, no, never mind, let's, let's just go back. God didn't say that. He said, instead of your son, you shall give me the lamb. And the lamb was provided. So that lamb stands as a picture, as a type of Christ, particularly in Christ's action as a substitute, as one that would take our place. In the same way that the lamb took the place of Isaac, Christ took the place of his church, of his people. Mind you, people like to say, Jesus died for us. Well, well who is us? If the person who is saying this is a born-again Christian, and he's referring to also another born-again Christian, then okay, yes. But I don't know if they really are. So what we can affirm for sure is that Jesus died for his people, whoever they may be. But for his people, not for everybody. Let, let that be made abundantly clear. We also saw that Abra uh, Isaac was supposed to be offered as a burnt offering. A burnt offering would become later on in the law of Moses that God gave him on the book of Exodus and very well detailed in Leviticus and also in, in Numbers and repeated in Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses, God would tell Moses the kinds of sacrifices and the burnt offering was the most common one, was the most common offering where the animal would be killed 
He would be chopped into pieces and the entire animal would be burned. Some sacrifices, they would burn portions of the animal. Some sacrifices, small portions of the animal, and most of it would be eaten at home. Some offerings, they would eat the entire animal at home in a big family setting, commanded by God. And they were supposed to call as many people as they could in order to, to enjoy that event. But the burnt offering, which was the most common, it was the offering in which the entire victim was offered. And we see that in Christ as well. Now, I said that the animal was chopped into pieces, but Jesus was not chopped into pieces. He never had the bone of his body broken, which was also a prophecy in the Old Testament. However, we see that his flesh was completely torn. Uh, if, you, if you read some articles on more, uh, people, these people that do a lot of um, historical studies and very devoted theologians, they, they make fantastic descriptions of the likelihood of how Christ's body would be, look, would be looking like by the end of the crucifixion. And um, the, the descriptions are terrifying. So we can say with great confidence that his body was torn apart. And he was completely offered to Christ, to God. He was given totally in whole, not in parts. And not only at the cross. I have mentioned to you guys over and over. When we say that his work at the cross saves us, we are using a synodoky, a figure of speech. When we take a portion to represent the entire matter, it was not only the work at the cross that saved, it was the entire work of Christ, the entire life of Christ. The entire obedience, passive and active. Passive meaning when he suffered, when he accepted the suffering, and active when he literally, actively did what his father in heaven told him to do. But let us now begin Enough, enough of, re, of reminding what we, we have already seen on the text. Let us go to verse 15, where it states, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. Now, which angel of the Lord is this? Now, we see this angel of the Lord over and over in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord this, the angel of the Lord that. And uh, sometimes you read it and you think, well, this sounds like an angel, like a regular angel. And all the times you read it and you think, well, this sounds like God himself. On this case, it looks like it's God himself. If you go back to verse 1 with me, you see that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. And then God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. So verse 1 tells us that God said. Now, when you come to verse 15, we see that the angel of the Lord called and said, particularly on verse 18, you have obeyed my voice. But it was not the angel that told Abraham to sacrifice, it was God. And now the angel is saying, no, that was my voice. So which one is it? Now, on this case here, we can affirm with total confidence that this angel of the Lord here is a reference to God himself. Now, if you want to be more detailed, I would say that this is, this is the voice of Christ speaking to Abraham already in the Old Testament. The second person of the Trinity at work already in the Old Testament. But th this is a figure that we we'll see throughout the entire Old Testament. The angel of the Lord this and the angel of the Lord that. We can say for sure that on this case is a divine manifestation. It is not only as an incredible being, but the most incredible of all, which is God. And he begins with a fantastic statement. He says, by myself I have sworn. Now, this is an oath, right? This is an oath that God himself is taking. Now, there is a whole lot of views, Christian views, when it comes to oaths. I'll give you one example here. Uh, you guys know that my number four was baptized recently on this church. And I took a picture of the baptism and uh, I, posted on my, I posted it online and I said, I swear that I will employ all my efforts in teaching you the word of God, my boy. And then a friend of mine said, I'm very happy that your son got baptized, but you should not be making oaths. 
the Bible says that the word of the Christian should be yes or no. And that's it. So, Felipe, you are doing something wrong here by making an oath. Never mind that I was pretty upset about that comment. <laughs> but the theology of oaths in the Bible is quite clear. It's not that difficult, actually. But what's amazing here is that God said something that he forbade us from saying. Now, on the book of Matthew, chapter 5, on the Sermon on the Mountain, that goes from chapter 5 until the end of chapter 7, Jesus said, don't swear by the heavens, which is the throne of God. Don't. And don't swear by yourself either, by your head. Because you, you cannot turn the hairs of your own head white. You, it's not yours to give. Don't swear by your life because you cannot kill yourself. It is not your life to give. So how can you swear by what you don't have? So the theology of Christian, the Christian theology of oath making is it's strict. You cannot make oaths just frivolously. Oaths can be done. You can take, you can swear allegiance. And throughout the entire Christian um, human history, people have made oaths. They are not problematic in themselves. They are problematic depending on the way you do it. If you do it frivolously, or if you, if you make an oath and you're swearing by things that you don't possess, or if you, are, if you swear by things that you're not entitled to give. So God forbid us to swear by our lives, because you cannot kill yourself. Your life belongs to God, so it's not yours to give. But God does what he forbids us from doing. And he says, by myself, by myself, I have sworn. The author of Hebrews looks at this passage and makes the following comment. God, knowing that there was nothing greater than him, by which he should swear. So he swore by himself. He swore by the highest of the highest, himself. That's the highest that he could go himself. W why? Does God... I mean, guys, think about the relationship. God! Man! Why is he taking an oath just to make us believe? He could just have said... I will do it, and you better believe me. That, that would have been enough. But he said, I swear, by me. Think about that. But you may remember Genesis 15, don't you? I'm sure you do. Abraham was instructed by God to bring the animals, and Abraham brought a heif or a goat, I think a a dove and another animal that I don't remember right now. He cut the animals, put half of the animal in one side and the other half in another side. He split the animals and laid them in two, two rows. And then God appeared as a fire and walked in the middle of the fire. That was a, what, what we call cutting a covenant. Cutting because the animals were cut. They were making a covenant, and the covenant, covenant, which was a common practice at the time, thousands of years ago, meant that the persons taking the covenant were promising the following. I wish that I become like this cut animals if I fail to do what I'm promising to do. That, that's when God made a covenant. And now, it looks like God is doing the same. By myself, I swear. So, if Abraham, if I fail Abraham, I can die. <laughs> look, look, at, look, at the, look at the statement. I mean, God doesn't die. God cannot be killed. If God were to die, that's it. End of everything. I cannot even say end of the story. It's just end. End, end, end in the most purest form. End. Perfect oblivion. So God is saying, Abraham, here's, here's what I'm going to give you as a collateral. Because you know, if I fail Abraham, here's the collateral, me. <laughs> you 
See, God, God is taking the highest form of promise that is available in any circumstance. And he's saying, Abraham, that's, that's how much I'm promising you this. That's how much I am promising you. If, if I break, Abraham, if I break my covenant, I can be broken like the animals in Genesis 15. So from now on, from here until the rest of the Bible, this is the new standard. This is the new standard. Every time that God opens his mouth, he's saying, here's the collateral if I fail. Me. I can die if I fail. A God cannot die. And he cannot fail. Both. He cannot die and he cannot fail. It, lo it looks like God is making a joke. I I'll be torn apart, Abraham. I wonder who's going to be doing the thorny, <laughs> the tearing apart. I can be torn apart, Abraham, if I ever fail. You not. You not. So God, God is really promising him, Abraham, whatever come out of my mouth, Abraham, it will be. Never, 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 never doubt, Abraham. I am my own collateral. I am my own. I, it reminds me of this, this joke that we have in Brazil. Uh, uh, decades ago, Brazilians enjoyed going to Paraguay, just across the border, and buy a lot of stuff there because taxes were lower there. They had cheaper prices. But some bad people there, uh, not many, not, not all, of course, but some, a lot of bad people there started selling uh, products that were like an imitation. Uh, sometimes you'd buy a box thinking that you're getting your tennis shoes inside, and you get home and you open, there is a brick inside. And then you come back, and it's the guy will tell you, oh, I never, I never sold you this. So it's, Brazilians started asking for the warranty. So what, what, which warranty do you give me that I'm buying a good product? And uh, it, became a fa I mean, it became a joke that many of these people would reply, La garantia soy yo. Like, I am the warranty. <laughs> and, and Brazilians started to laugh like, what do you mean you are the warranty? You, you cannot be the warranty. You're the one making the promise. So it became a joke in Brazil. La garantia soy yo. Eh? But that's exactly what God is doing here. I am the warranty. I, I will not fail. This will happen because I said it will happen. End of story. Now, look at the context. Guys, God is not saying anything new here, is he? Look at what he's saying to Abraham. Abraham, blessing, I will bless you. Multiply, I will multiply you. That, it sounds a bit funny in English, but in, that's a common Hebrew expression. In, God already used this when he said, um, when he make the first threat. He said to Adam, uh, on the day that you eat of the tree uh, of the fruit of the no of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on that day you surely die. Literally, he said, "Dying you shall die." It's just a, a very emphatic manner of saying, "You will like really die." So what God is saying here is, "I will bless you like a lot. I really, really capital R bless you." And I'll multiply you. I'll really, really multiply you. That, that's his point. I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. He already said that. As the sand which is on the seashore. But before we go any further, we see here that God is not saying anything new. In fact, he said this like three, four, five times already. Plenty of times. But observe, observe the language that he uses on verse 16, because, I find this amazing, because, oh, this because looks like, it, 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 I read this and I think, this shouldn't be here, what do you mean because we have done this thing? Because Abraham has obeyed, God will do A, B, and C, but before Abraham obeyed, God had already promised that he was going to do A, B, and C. So it is, now which one is it? Is God blessing him because he obeyed? Or he was able to obey because God already blessed him in the past? Which one is it? Now, if I read only, if, if all I have is this verse here, I would say, well, God is blessing him because he passed the test. If, the, if all I had was this text, I would say this. 
But when I see that God had already made the promise, that God had already said, if I fail in blessing you, Abraham, I, I can be done, it can be done to me as it was done to these animals. So he had already promised. And now he's saying, because, what do you mean because? He already said that. So which one is it? Is, are we looking at a case here of human responsibility? Or are we looking at a case of divine sovereignty? Which one is it? Is the blessing coming because Abraham obeyed? Or Abraham obeyed because the blessing already came in the past and enabled him to obey? So that a new blessing could come now that he had already obeyed. Which one is it? A or B? Well, and the answer is very simple but difficult to understand. Both. 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 We, human responsibility is something that we preach. Yes. Divine sovereignty is something that we preach. Yes. But Felipe, those don't work. Those, that doesn't match. Well, see, I'm the first one to acknowledge that from our limited human perspective, well, not a chance. It doesn't match at all. Let's be honest. How, how, who, who, what is on the line here? Human responsibility of God or, or God's sovereignty? From the human perspective, you got to be A or B. But from the divine perspective, which the Bible makes abundantly clear, these are not in opposition. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said, I don't need to explain how these two go together. Let me tell you, enemies need reconciliation. Friends don't. So why would I reconcile things that were never in opposition in God's mind? And I'll take Spurgeon's attitude. In our perspective, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't match. It doesn't work. From God's perspective, no problem at all. So how should you understand this? Should you, should you rely on God's goodness in order to, to defeat sin in your life? Oh, yes. Should you, rely, sh should you employ all your efforts in your sanctification progress? Well, yes. So at the same time, you do both. You understand that it's all up to God. And at the same time, you understand that he, you have total responsibility. Well, Felipe, you, you're tying a knot in my head. Well, the Bible presents these two matters in, and leaves them in suspense. It just said, you, you, and I'll prove it to you. If you think, well, Felipe, I think you're just making this up. Here's, here's the proof. Here's the proof. Romans 11, verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Complete divine sovereignty. Complete. Now, here's another one for human responsibility. Pers Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So which one is it? Is it up to me or up to God? And the answer is, uh-huh. My wife and I, we used to, to joke about this. So oftentimes I'll ask, Gia, do you want, do you want me to get you an apple juice or a lemon juice? Oh, yes. And I would get mad. I said, woman, <laughs> lemon or apple? <laughs> and it became a joke in our home until one day she even showed me an, a very funny advertisement of this person asking this other person, so do you want this or that? And the person would say, mm-hmm. No, 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 I meant A or B. Oh, that's right. And it became a joke in our home. But on this case, it's exactly this. Which one, do I, which one does the Bible teach? Human responsibility or divine sovereignty? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Both. The Bible teaches both. And look at the level of responsibility. We are not talking about a shallow Guys, I say this, I'm saying this right now. And if you tremble as I say it, know that the one who is saying trembles with you. Look at the level that we're talking about here. 
God said, because you did not withhold your own, you did not withhold your own son from me. Now that's a massive because, huh? Because even your son, you are willing to sacrifice. I mean, that's a massive deal. Even your son. Because of that, I saw that you fear me. That's what God said. <coughs> now, if we have a little bit of logic in our heads, we also make the, we will make the following conclusion: If he had denied God his own son. God would say, you don't really fear me. Now the Bible says that the blessing of God in heaven is the ultimate, is the, up, the, the, the highest blessing of God belong to those who fear him. The Bible says that. So we are looking at the situation here that where God is saying, if you would have failed, Abraham, I would consider you a non-fearing, a non-God-fearing non person. What, what a level we're dealing with. Brothers and sisters, why am I saying this? I'm saying this to show us, to show all of us, myself included, myself at the top of the list, that the demands for Christianity are phenomenally high. Phenomenally. Did you notice that this is not the first time that God tells Abraham to part from his son? He had, another, he had another boy, Ishmael. And he said, Abraham, do not think it hard that your wife is telling you to kick your son out. What do you mean, do not think it hard? What, what can that possibly mean? Like, he's my boy. He's my boy, and I'm going to part from him. And God, God, God not, not some senseless, mindless person. God is saying, Abraham, do not think that hard. What? How? And that's exactly what God was saying. And then God comes and asks again. Oh, remember that I told you to part from your, your number one son? Not this one? You part from him also. The level, the demands of God are for our everything. There is not a bone in your body. There is not a cell in your person. There is not an area of your life that God would accept exclusion from. In fact, God demands the throne of every area of your life. God demands first position in your financial life, in your sexual life. God demands first position in your emotional life, in your professional life, in your family life, in your relation, in your relations. God demands Total control of all areas of your life. That's it. That's, that there is no higher demand. If you can think that God will demand, God does demand. There is no area of our life that we can say, you know the, 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 the word um, compartmentalization? You know? You divide your areas into sections. Guys are very good in that. Women, women they're really bad at that. Everything in the mix. Everything is everything. Guys, they, they divide the areas of their life so well. Like, you can open a box of one area of a guy's life and the other box is perfectly closed. But whichever you are, God want to be in all these boxes. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that he's jealous. The Bible states that with all words. God is a jealous God. He accepts no other. He accepts no concubines. Concubine. He accepts no... Second place. None. And now, another thing that I see on this verse here, on verse 16, that it's amazing for me. He said, your only son. Take your son. Abraham, take your son, your only son. But wait a minute, that's not his only son. He had another boy. Ishmael was alive. We know, we know. On verse 23, I think, I think in verse 23, you see, and the Bible says that Ishmael lived and he became a father of many nations himself. The Arabic people is here today. They exist. They call Hagar their queen, while the Jews would call Sarah their queen. So, yes, Ishmael was alive and well, thank you very much. And God said, your only son. How? Did God consider Ishmael a non-person? Kinda, 
Kind of. Here's what the Bible means. Here's the theology behind this. In God's eyes, there is the church. And everything else is another category. Listen to this. In God's understanding, there is one category called the church. He's chosen, the elect, the one who are born, paid, born again, and bought by the blood of Christ. That's the church of present, past, and future. That's the church. And then there's everything else. There's everything else. In God's mind, his concern was for Isaac. To the point that when he, when he spoke to Abraham, even though Ishmael was alive, God was saying, Isaac is your only son. In my eyes, Abraham, got no other. Why is God, God is using this language to show that his care is for his people, not for his enemies. Oh, but Felipe, you don't need to be that radical. In what you're saying, it looks like there is the friends of God and the enemies of God and nothing in between. Yeah. You see, I'll give you somebody that knows a whole lot more than I. His name is Jesus. Luke chapter 11, verse 23. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. <laughs> G- you know the, that joke? That joke is a story. It's quite thoughtful. It's not funny. It's thoughtful. Uh, there, there was a, a wall. And this gentleman was walking on the top of the wall. And on his right, he had angels. And on his left, he had demons. And the angels were saying, come to our side, come to our side. And, and cheering him up and said, Christ to assist you. And give him all the kinds of encouragement. He has a benefit. Uh, an eternity with the pres- in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Oh, he's blessing the most wonderful people. You come in life, you enjoy a church. You have blessed brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're doing all the encouragement. And on the other side, the devils were just chilling, relaxing enjoying themselves. The guy looked at the devil and the angels and said, look, the angels are, they want me to go to their side. But you guys don't want me on your side. Why are you guys so relaxed? And the devils replied, we own the wall. And he was at the top of the wall. He was walking at the top of the wall thinking, do I go to the, to the demons or to the angels? And the demons said, you are on, the, you are on our territory. We own the wall. The wall is ours. That's what Jesus meant. There's only two categories. Church and non-church. His people and his enemies. His friends and those who hate him. That's it. That's it. Jesus said that. Not my opinion. If I were the one writing the Bible, I'd say, yeah, there may be a, a, a blurry gray area here. Jesus said, no, there's no gray. There's no gray. Just, just black and white. Our ability to see what is black and what is white may be complex. But God, no. God, God can see clearly. Oh, that's white. That's black. That those are enemies. Those are friends. These are friends. Those are enemies. Simple like that. And now we come to verse 17 when it says, I'll multiply you. I'll multiply the sands of the, the stars of heaven. We have seen this already. And as the sand which is on the seashore. That, that's new. That's new. First time. But same message. Okay, no, no, no real new message here. Here's the point. I'll make this quite brief. God said, before, I think Genesis um, I think 13, tells Abraham, go out of your tent, look at the skies. Look at the stars. I'll multiply you like the stars. Guys, remember that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldeans. The common religion in, the, in Ur of the Chaldeans was the worship of the stars. Abraham came from a place And we can say with quite a bit of confidence that Abraham himself was a pagan and used to worship the stars. And now God is saying, Abraham, look at the stars. Look at those things that you looked a thousand times before and worshiped them a thousand times before. Before, the stars were your object of worship. Now, Abraham, the stars are a reminder for you that I will multiply you like the stars. From now on, Abraham, the stars is not what you worship. The stars are to remind you of what you should worship, which is me. And now he says, 
Look at the dust. At Genesis 13, he says, look at the dust. So look up. Now look at the dust. I'll multiply you like the dust. And now he's saying, look at the sand on the seashore. And when you go to the beach, I'm sure all of you have been to the beach, I hope. If you're not, you should. You look far, right? That's the first thing you do when you get to the beach. You look as far as where the beach goes. So God is saying, look everywhere, Abraham. Look everywhere, and I will remind you. All that you see, stars, dust, sand, will serve to remind you, because, Abraham, I need to remind you often, Abraham, because you're but human. You forget as forgetful can be. That's how bad you, you are. You forget a lot. And guys, and we are the same. We forget a lot. We forget a lot. Remember when the disciples were crossing the, the Sea of Galilee? And Jesus, Jesus had just done miracles. And the sea got rough and they said, Oh, Jesus, wake up. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? Oh, you see? <laughs> they just saw Jesus showing everybody how lovely he was. And now they're saying, Jesus, you don't care, do you? You don't care. See how, how they went from A to Z in a minute? All it took was one storm. And they thought, they went from, he is, he, he is the most lovely of all. And they went from that to, he doesn't care. All it took was one storm. Ray, think about it. They suffered Ray and they forgot. That's why God is saying, Abraham, remember. Look at the stars, Abraham, and remember. Look at the sand. Remember. Look at the dust. Remember, Abraham. Abraham, don't forget, Abraham. And we may say, but it's been for Church of Livonia. Don't forget. Don't forget the promises of the Lord. Don't forget that what he said he would do, he will bring it to completion. Don't forget. Don't forget. And now we come to this very apparently, 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 Odd ending. Amazing story. Like he was about to kill the son and God intervened. Abraham, Abraham, don't, don't take the ram. Abraham, I love you. You know, because of you, you, you obeyed me. I swear by myself, Abraham, I'll multiply you. are going to be awesome, amazing. The whole world will be blessed by you, Abraham. Jesus will come. And fantastic stuff. And now genealogy. It sounds so weird, right? But it's not. It's not. it's not. Look at verse 20. Now it came to pass, after these things that it was told Abraham, Abraham was not inquiring about, Abraham was not searching, he fell on his lap, saying, indeed, Milcah also born children to your brother Nahor. Let me ask you this. Was Abraham, at this time, was he looking for a wife for Isaac? See, God, who was empowering Abraham to be faithful, so that God would come and say, because Abraham, because you are faithful, which by the way, you are faithful because I made you faithful to begin with, because of that, Abraham, I'll multiply you. Now, for that multiplication, your boy got to have babies, right? So your boys need to get married, so I'm providing a wife for your boy. Look at this, Abraham. I have already provided. The way Moses, Moses is the one that wrote this, okay? Mo, the way Moses arranges the biblical text is very, very intelligent. First, Moses shows God promises Abraham will be prosperous. And now here, the wife is arranged for that boy to marry. You see how Moses, is, Moses wants us to see this. The same God that was empowering Abraham to be faithful, the same God that was preserving Isaac, is the same God that at the same time was preparing a wife for Isaac. See, he, remember what I said in the beginning of the sermon? God is above time. God is in the past. God is in the present. God is in the future. God is everywhere and every time. That's, that's, that's our God. He was... He was preparing all this stuff. Abraham had not a clue, but God was taking care. Now we look at this family. What a family, isn't it? The man has a very fertile wife. Fantastic. Eight. 
The woman gave him eight babies. Amazing. And we see that the man was greedy. A wife that gave him eight children. Eight men. Eight males. All males here. Um, and then he also wants a concubine for more babies. Twelve. At that time, they saw one thing. The, allow me to open this window on this sermon. At that time, they saw one thing that today we have closed our eyes to. But the Bible says that. Children are a blessing from the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is the one that fills his um, quiver with the arrows that are the children. Now, if you go to war, and here's your weapon, bow and arrow, how many arrows would you put on your quiver? You pack it full. The thing would be bursting. Obviously. If you have a little bit of sense, that's what you should do. And the Bible says, blesses the man who, has, who fills his quiver with arrows. And now this man was actually greedy. He had eight. He could said, woman, you, you are, you're fantastic. Amazing. No, no, I want more. I want, I want more. Now we see men with a wife that gave him eight children and a co-combine that gave him four. Does that remind you of anyone? Does that remind you of somebody? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. We call him Jacob. He had wives, plural. We can debate if it was fair that he would take the second wife. You know, he wanted only one to begin with. That's, that's debatable. I'm not going to debate it here. But anyways, regardless, he had two. And then he, his, first, his wife gave him children. And he, they were not satisfied. No, no, not enough. We want more. Bring the cocumbine. Now here's my problem with the cocumbines. Doesn't matter how you slice it. Doesn't matter how nice the husband is. The cocumbine will always have a lower status than the wife. Always, always, always. Even if we bring this behavior to today's day and age, it doesn't matter how you take it. it until today, you take, you take like countries that are polygamous, that accept polygamy. The second and third wife always have less rights than the first wife. So I, I call it, the, it, it demeans woman. If I, if I were a woman, I would not want to be a second wife, third wife, a co-combine. I would want to be the only, 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 only wife. That's it. You know? And preferably that I live a long life and that man marries only me. That's it. Now, I have daughters. I would not want my daughters to be co-combines at all. Second wives, third wives, I, I wouldn't. But you may think, well, Philip, this is not a... This is the, the brother of Abraham, right? This is not the family of the promise, right? Uh, let me bring it to today, days and age. These are not Christians, right? Well, look at the family of Jacob. See, sometimes f families are in general quite messy, aren't they? Families in general, they're quite difficult, right? I, I'm not yours, I'm sure yours is perfect. Not yours, of course not yours. Who would say such a thing? But families in general are very complex. See here, see the family of Jacob, it was a mess. Look at the family of Jacob. We look at this family here. One, we would be very comfortable in saying Christian family, so to speak. Another one, not a Christian family. And they are just like each other. Just like each other. Now, why am I emphasizing this? On whatever depends on you. Listen to this. Please listen to this. On whatever depends on you. Make sure that your families are fantastic. Now, guys, I know, I know that many times, oftentimes, it, it, there's, there's only so much you can do. I know that. But whatever depends on you, make sure that your families are Christ-focused families. Make sure. Employ, employ all your waking moment on that effort. If you, if you, if you are successful on that, you see, there is very little of all the things that even pale in comparison when it comes to the importance of the matter. Now let me bring the sermon to its end. I have three, three statements. 
for the end of this sermon. Statement number one. Because Abraham did not withhold his son from God, God said to him, I will call you God-fearing now. But remember John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Abraham was willing to give his son to God. And God said, you don't need. I only wanted to see if you'd be willing. But Abraham, I will literally give my son to you. Abraham, what I do not allow you to do, I wanted to see if you would go through. I wanted to see that. But I didn't allow you to go through. I don't want you to go through. The Bible says that he never entered the mind of God, human sacrifice. Of course, there's a figure of speech there. It's an exaggeration. Of course, God thinks about everything. It was a common practice at the time. But God said, I never wanted it. I never desired such a thing. Abraham, I just wanted to see if you'd go through, Abraham. But Abraham, let me tell you, I will go through with, with that, Abraham. The son that I did not allow you to give, oh, guess what? I'm going to give you mine. And I'm going to go through. And my son, Abraham, my son will go through. He'll be on a cross. He'll be on a cross. And Abraham saw that. Let me prove it to you. Jesus once said, Abraham, your father, he was speaking to the Pharisees, and said, Abraham, your father, Abraham saw my day. Which day? Abraham was perfectly dead when Jesus came. Perfectly dead. The, 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 the dust of his bones were gone. That, that's really gone. And, God, and Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. He saw me. Tell me more. He was happy. And on the day that Abraham saw me, you Pharisees, Abraham was glad. I think Jesus was talking about this. Abraham, Abraham saw me. Abraham saw that he was going to give his own son. But he understood that God would give his. And here I am. Abraham saw my day. My day is about to come. My day is about to come when I'll die on the cross. And Abraham saw that. And Abraham was so happy. And, and we rejoice. We rejoice because what Abraham saw ahead, we can see looking back. It's so much better to say God has already provided than God will provide, right? Guys, Abraham died with this. That's all Abraham had when he died. God will, future tense, God will provide. We live on a day and age that we can say, God has already provided Jesus. And when Jesus was about to die, he said, that telestai, it's paid, it's done, it's complete. I paid the entire bill. There is nothing more to be done. And that's, that's so comforting for us. There is nothing more for Christianity to do, but to remember Christ and to be Christ-like. And my last one, is if God gave us Christ, if, if God gave us Christ, and he did, and he did, then, this is not my question, this is a question that I got from the Bible. How shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? The biblical author is saying, if God already gave us Christ, which was the most important of all, well, do you think he's going to deny us anything else? If he gave us the most important stuff, do you think the small details will be denied to us? Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you in the following manner. God already gave you Christ. So when you come to him and you beg him, Jesus, take away my sins, forgive me, and make me more Christ-like, do you think he'll deny you that? Do you think he'll deny you the ability to be sanctified? Do you think he'll deny you that? He already gave his son, that's it. Why would he deny you sanctification? The, the price for the sanctification is already paid. Why would he deny you the actual sanctification? He wouldn't. Oh, he wouldn't. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O Lord. For you did not deny us Christ. You denied us nothing. 
Brother, your best was Christ. Christ is the best. He is the one who was, is, and is to come. No bad, nothing better than Christ in the whole universe. Nothing is better than Christ. And Lord, you did not spare him. You allowed Abraham to spare his son. But you did not allow yourself to spare yours. You wouldn't have it, and neither would Jesus, and neither would the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What a wonderful God we have. Shape us, O oh Lord. Lord. The Bible says that you wouldn't deny us. Lord, which father would deny his son bread when he asks for bread? Or give him stone instead of bread? Or give him a snake instead of food? Oh Lord, we ask you for one very good thing. That you make us more Christ-like. That the Presbyterian Free Church of Livonia be sanctified that it may grow, that it may be better, much better. For the glory of your holy name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.